This is Linux Unplugged, episode 19 for December 17th, 2013. And welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that's wiped nearly every hard drive in the house trying out SteamOS. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey there, Matt. Episode 18, buddy. And uh, are you feeling holly? Are you feeling jolly? Are you checking feeling, your list? It, I'm checking my list, feeling unplugged, uh, yeah. feeling verbal, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, is, this would be a good one for folks to uh, join us live because we're recording two episodes this week yeah. to make up for the holiday week because we want you to have some new shows. We know that uh, just because it's the holidays doesn't mean you don't need your update on the weekly Linux issues of our day, and uh, on the pre-show, it got a little lively. You know, we were getting into <laughs> it, Matt, but that's good. It opens us up a little bit, kind of gives us some breathing room. Yep. And I got a sandwich waiting for him in the other room, too, so that, that adds a little bit of edge to this whole thing, because I know <laughs> at any moment I could just be ripping into that sandwich, but no, I'm doing a Linux show right now. Nice. It's a sacrifice I make for the people. Well, Matt, uh, this week, we kicked off our SteamOS coverage. It's official. It's here in the Linux Action Show. Season 30, Episode 1. Then in Coda Radio, the topic came up again, and we talked about the potential slight against Canonical in the choice to go with Debian. So if you oh, yes. missed that discussion, go listen to uh, this week's Coda Radio. We have uh, a pretty good, robust chat in there about the whole that, that whole aspect of it um, and some of the challenges that Val's face. So that the conversation continues there. And then today, um, we're going to chat with uh, our local internet lug. Is that even a thing? Can you have a local internet thing? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I mean, we'll sure. just, we're, yeah. we're going to. <laughs> we, just, we just did. Uh, just we're going to chat just with them it. about uh, their experiences experimenting with SteamOS and their thoughts on it, too. Um, and, and the reason is, is I, I don't know, actually, on reflection some, for some days now, I'm not sure SteamOS is going to be the biggest deal that we're all making it out to be. I think it's super important. Uh, but I don't know if it's like uh, really baby Jesus coming down on a on like a unicorn from the clouds to save all of Linux. I think it's probably somewhere in between. <laughs> nice. We'll find out. But I wanted to start with our follow-up. Last week, we had a great chat about uh, the usefulness of Linux user groups, you could say, and the whole lug concept in general. And uh, that uh, fired off some uh, some good feedback. The first one comes in from Anonymous. He says, hey, Chris and Matt. And then he has engage rant mode. When I go to a local hackerspace, I meet the people who I know from local lugs, which I think have stopped meeting altogether. When I first went to the lug and asked a question about Ubuntu, the guy literally stopped me mid-first sentence and pointed me to someone else from the Ubuntu loco who was there and told me never to ask him for help. I had to learn who would answer my questions and who wouldn't. And to be fair, there were those who were very helpful and ex with explaining general concepts or solving specific problems. And, you know, you see this too, right, online? Like, there's different personality types and some people are like, oh, Ubuntu? Yeah, you need to go talk to the Ubuntu guys, right? And there's some people who are willing to help you regardless. And there's just personality that... I, I could imagine it was even more exasperated when you meet somebody in person. Oh, I imagine so. And I never really understood that because I've seen I've seen people react to that. And actually, yeah. I've been the one that like swoops in and says, wow, that guy was a douchebag and comes in and actually tries to answer their question, even though I may or may not be into whatever they're talking about. Yeah. I try and at least not be a jerk about it. Right. So. Exactly. Like, so, uh, you know, you and I might go like every now and then like we're, we're, we're testing a rig out and we're not doing the show. We'll be like, oh, geez, yeah. Ubuntu. Like when you get all those app app port error reports <laughs> right. that just pop up constantly. Yep. You know, you go, oh, geez, Ubuntu, really? You guys still do this? But it doesn't mean you you refuse somebody help. Exactly. Uh, he goes on to say, however, while the participants would humor me by having a basic noob conversation, they tended to move on to exchanging information or having debates about advanced topics, which was the reason they were there. Overall, there seemed to be attitude of RTFM. Uh, interesting, right? Because you could see how you have a conflict there where there's people there that want to talk about system D, they want to talk about C groups, and they want to talk about w the direction of the GNOME project. They don't really want to talk about how to get uh, Office running under Wine so much. And uh, But there are people there that do. Uh, and and it, RTFM is a hard thing to just tell somebody, but at the same time, I often find myself saying, well, here's what you need to know. Go read this you know, wiki entry. 
Exactly. But there's two interesting challenges to the RTFM is, uh, one, if you're having network issues and that's your only computer, good yep, luck with that. Yep, yep. <laughs> and, uh, and two, they don't really, unless you know what to look for, a lot of times finding the correct answer that isn't flooded with half answers is uh, discouraging. Right, right. Or out of date because things can right. change really fast. He says, exactly. ironically, the same guys who shut me down while at open source conferences extolted how employees at his company were being taught to use open source tools to answer questions. As I listened to his answer, I thought how more effectively he could address the person's questions if they learned how to teach, i.e. how to impart information. <laughs> this right. is when I came to understand why my lug was bad at teaching. All the gray beards were self-taught and expected everybody else to do the same. His example was getting people to break their stuff, but this is how I did it, and this is the MS Word mindset. Uh, he goes on to say, my lug is YouTube now, where the people who want to teach Linux topics in a nice, clear way are at. Which is great for me because I learn way better being told something than reading it, which is why I first started listening or going to the lug, sorry. Lastly, my local hackerspace has a weekly class on various topics where someone will say to me, come join class X. Teaching mm. is part of their DNA. Lugs can die as far as I care. Anonymous. Disengage rant mode. So I, I, I could be a bastard when I say this. I get the sense that Anonymous might be younger. Yeah, I would say so. That that's when the local lug here, at least back when I was still, you know, popping in and out occasionally. Your average age was at least in mid forties, if not maybe even a touch older. But do you see, like, okay, uh, so, so I think for a younger person coming into it, it, you you're dealing with people that are amazingly set in their ways. But also, and, there know, is value in being told to RTFM because if you learn how to research your own problem and solve them, that helps you down the road. And if I just tell you, okay, to update your DNS, go edit your Etsy Resolve comp file, then that that gets you that immediate problem fixed, but that doesn't teach you anything about how networking actually works on Linux. True, true. But I also think it depends on what level of learning they're looking to do. If they're actually looking to perhaps pursue this as a career or even a, a serious hobby, absolutely yes. If they're looking to just make their computer work, you got to be kidding me. Um, you know, so I think that there's got to be there's got to be a balance there. I think there should be a qualifying checkbox that says what's your what's your what's your long term goal. So that we can help address this in a way or even find out if this is a place you should be. Lugs are really good for people that maybe are interested in pursuing something in a career fashion or a serious hobby. Because that's what they are. They're serious hobbyists. They're not there to screw around. Right. Yeah. So, And I think YouTube is, uh, much like the stuff I used to do, is definitely for people that are there to screw around. And that's okay. Right. And there's but, such a wider variety. Like you have sure. people that are teaching the super basic stuff. Uh, then you have people like us who are kind of doing more of the current events, how-tos mm -hmm. and digging into stuff. Right. Uh, so there's a, there's a wider range of availability. Yeah. Uh, but I, I also kind of felt like our anonymous writer here wasn't fully appreciating perhaps some of the lessons their gray beards were trying to pass on to him. And it's not so much they're trying to blow him off and get rid of him is that they are trying to give him, you know, you, it's the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, right? That saying. Right. They're trying to, they're trying to, or you can, you know, you can teach a man to fish. They're trying to teach him how to fish, basically. Is what I think. Yeah, I, I th and I and I totally get that, but I think that goes back to why our public school system is a, is a joke, in my opinion. It's oh, because okay. it's it's this one way fits all crap, and it doesn't work that way, mm -hmm. um, you know. And so I think I think that we need yeah. to really establish yeah. uh, right there at the door, right there when yeah. they first come in, have a sheet that says, "Let's make sure we're not wasting everyone's time." And that's very gray beard and approach because it's very much you know it's me 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 yeah. all about me, well, and uh, you know and, that's fine. And to defend <laughs> our writer, uh, he said you know he's better at visual and audio learning than he is at yeah. reading learning. So when you him to go read something he just doesn't retain it as well and there's just I'm completely different... on the writer's side i think that i think the person who wrote the letter is spot on correct yeah, i yeah. think that the entire experience sucked for him i totally do yeah, yeah. <clears throat> all right well miles writes in on the same topic mm. this is uh bring one of those gray beards you speak of and a lug member for 20 years and i could be he says uh, i think he meant to write i can say that lugs have lost some appeal but also many of us still enjoy the direct people contact they can offer our lug is full of former punch card cowboys, but we also have many younger and father child members who bond over the talks. And that that last that's sentence, cool. that, that struck a chord with me. I could see yeah. that, right? Because sure. you know, you you're teaching a bit of the culture and in your like so uh, I was thinking about my son Dylan, and if I was teaching him about Linux, there's only so much realism there is when you're just showing him stuff on the internet and you're talking to him about it. But when you actually go to other people and you see what they're doing and listening to their experiences, what they've tried, what hasn't worked, uh, right. it's much more um, tangible. And I think for uh, perhaps getting somebody into it, uh, that could be beneficial. He says, our topics are not just straight Linux, but other technologies as well. It also provides a great opportunity as a technical forum of Toastmasters 
for many to develop public speaking and presentation skills. Interesting. Good point. Yeah, Lo- that is. You know, because, right, because you got to go there. Maybe you're going to do a talk on on, mm-hmm. uh, on Docker. And, you know, you have to learn how to present. And you can then take that skill and apply it to your job or whatever, you a podcast or whatever, Agreed. right? Mm-hmm. He says, lugs are still valid and relevant resources, but like anything worth it, you get out of them what you put in. I drive two hours each way to mine every month, and I still get something from every meeting. That's cool. Well, it sounds like that this is not only a person that's well matched to to a lug, but they're well matched to their lug too. Right. That's fantastic. Right. Yep. I agree. And that's cool. It was a good perspective from Miles, so I, I appreciate mm-hmm. him writing that in. Definitely. All right, Matt. Well, uh, we'll get, we'll loop in our uh, our mumble room on their thoughts on the uh, topic. But before we get to that, I want to thank our sponsor this week, and that is Ting.com. Now, Ting is mobile that makes sense. My mobile source provider and Matt's mobile service Fish. provider. Oh yeah, Matt. We are liking ourselves the Ting. Why? I'll tell you why. No contracts, no early termination fees, and you only pay for what you use. Picture it now, people. You go over to linux.ting.com, which will save you $25 off your first device or $25 off your first month if you have a Sprint-compatible device, and look through their devices. They have some great ones, and what's awesome is not only do you get a discount applied to them, but they also have additional discounts on some of them, and you will own this device outright. This is yours now. Just like when you buy a laptop or you buy a desktop or a tablet, you own that. It's not subsidized. And by the way, um, there was a great piece. Uh, I, I don't remember by which publication, but you can look it up. I'll, I'll try to link to it in the show notes uh, about the uh, the massive marketing and surveillance program that some of the telcos have. And this is one of these things that gets really creepy and really shady. And you never know what is being installed on your device. And uh, Verizon's the worst. Uh, they they have a system that is uh, optimized at, for example, uh, if you like to go to a local sports game, they will determine if you're somebody who drives home immediately afterwards mm-hmm. or if uh, you stop by the bar first. And then they'll try to tailor the marketing. They'll sell that information and try to tailor that marketing to you, which is pretty creepy. Uh, and these kinds of things are capable, are possible because they own the software stack on that phone. They own the device. They're lending it to you, and they are they are getting money out of you every single month for that. And they also own the software stack on that. Now, I don't know about you, but I would never buy a computer that I did not have administrative root access over. And that's what happens when you buy one of these phones directly from these carriers. Well, Ting is enabling you to buy a Nexus directly from Google Play and bring it over to the Ting network, and then you only pay for what you use. You have no contract and no early termination fees. That's a huge deal because that's exactly how it should be. And as we become more dependent on these devices, this is going to become more and more critical. But not only that, Ting is only $6 flat rate per month. And then it's just they take your minutes, your messages, and your megabytes. They add them up at the end of the month. Whatever bucket you fall into, that's what you pay. Hotspot, tethering, caller ID, voicemail, all included with the plan. If you turn on hotspot and tethering, you just pay for the data usage. You don't have to be in some sort of special family shared tier or something like that. It just works. So go over to linux.ting.com to get started. And by the way, if you're in a contract right now, hit that how much would you save button, find out how much you would save by switching to Ting, and then they're going to help you out with your early termination fee. They will pay up to $75 per line that you need to cancel. I love the Nexus 5. I've also got the HTC One. Matt has the Note 2. And Matt, how much oh, yeah. do you love that big screen? I love the big screen. As a matter of fact, it's my go-to phone at this point because everything's so big and bright and crisp and clear. Yep. It's great. And they're taking... Uh, they're they're uh, So if you combine the $31 discount that they have on the Note 2 right now plus our $25 discount... You can buy the note outright. You completely own it for $600. Now, think about this, because this is something that all of the cell phone companies, I bet, if I could make a little 2014 prediction, I would bet you that the higher-end phones on the cellular networks will lose their subsidized status in 2014. Both uh, the two biggest wireless carriers in the United States have stated they want to discontinue subsidized plans. Now, our friends across the pond are rolling their eyes like, yeah, you guys are just now catching on to this. Here in the States, (laughs) the subsidized thing has been going on for a while, right? Uh, But it sounds like it's coming to an end. So get ahead of the curve. Start saving money now. Switch to Ting, and you'll thank me later. Go over to linux.ting.com. And a huge thanks to Ting for sponsoring Linux on. Plugged. Love, Love those guys. Love, Love it, Matt. Those. You Good know stuff. what? Let's give that a ding. Ding. All a right, ding uh, for Matt. Ting. Uh, Fox News alert. Uh, we're bringing in the uh, the mumble room right now, and I I just wanted to kind of let's start with this topic, mumble room. Uh, Popey, you brought up the whole topic of lugs last week, 
And um, I, I don't know what your thoughts are on it from now, but here we've heard two different perspectives. Uh, we've heard from possibly a younger guy who says, I, was, I got basically told RTFM. And we've heard from an older guy who says he gets a lot out of it. Uh, are lugs maybe just not the appropriate place anymore for basic user support? It's funny you should um, you should mention the RTFM thing. We we see a bit of that on my on my lug, and you know, grumpy old people or the grey beards or whatever you want to call them. Um, and one of the things when the and you also mentioned locos when the Ubuntu loco teams were set up, one of the kind of not a rule but a, a recommendation was that you don't throw an RTFM at people and you don't throw a let me Google that for right. you link at people because it's just rude it, it's well, okay you could argue it's teaching someone to fish but actually you could say here's the answer to your actual question and by well, the way you'll find that in the map I agree page. but is that because and this is a question for Alan uh is, is that because the Linux documentation in whole is kind of ass compared to something like the FreeBSD handbook so example if I ask Alan how do I do x in FreeBSD if he tells me go read it on the FreeBSD handbook I don't really consider that a disservice because the FreeBSD, ha FreeBSD handbook is easily available. It's well documented. It's well laid out. It's an official source. So, Alan, when you sit there as a FreeBSD user watching us Linux users try to help each other's problems, do you see this as a major hole in the Linux ecosystem? Uh, partly, but one of the biggest difference I would say is I would take the time to point you to the section of the handbook. Like, Thank you. Yep. Because it has the, uh, we do the anchor tags, I can point you to like the chapter 24.7.3 that explains exactly the answer to your question rather than just telling you go to freebsd.org slash handbook right, right. and find which it which is yourself. what I'm saying that's, that's right, exactly right. the same as what I'm saying point someone to exactly the, the piece of documentation but, you okay, want to okay but here's now, the problem though you know, is like they the, could have googled it as quickly as I did but or maybe not as quickly because I know. know all the chapters of the handbook yeah. and where, where to look yeah but like, uh, what is it though? So uh, let's, let's, you could probably pick on the Arch Wiki, but let's pick on the Ubuntu Wiki because I've noticed it uh, this week as I was running this Leopard Extreme is sometimes I go to the Ubuntu Wiki and stuff is literally written for Ubuntu 9 something and it f quickly falls out of date. Uh, and I feel like this is, this, this Wiki creep is a common problem for Linux and I think it aggravates the problem of not being able to tell people to RTFM because the truth is RTFM might not give them the right information. And that's, well, that's uh, why one a little while ago, one of the UDSs, George Castro, who works for Canonical, gave a talk, a lightning talk, that we're doing a disservice to our customers and our users mm -hmm. by having old, out-of-date information on the wiki and on forums and, you know, various web pages on blogs as well. You might think you're you're doing a you know a great service to write a blog post, but when you don't update that in three years' time, that's bad because people still go back to it because it's got certain keywords that they're looking for mm -hmm. and it might it might right. not be up to date. So his his recommendation was to go through the wiki and delete pages that just are wrong. Mm. Just delete them. Get rid of them. Just expire when they show them up, essentially. Just completely delete them because when they show up in Google search results, that's worse than no answer showing up because you're leading, you know, you're telling someone to use, you know, NDIS wrapper with the Broadcom, whatever, right. that's, that actually could make their experience worse than it not working. Yeah. You know, they well, you, you could, could do screw their machine up. Other wikis have it where if it's an old an old note that it will an old an old post that gives you like a bad tutorial from like three years ago it was good then but now it's awful they'll have a note that says this is just how many years old or whatever here's the newer version yeah that's exactly right they'll say like this is targeted for you know X release and you know uh, click here for maybe the but, updated but release the current, or something yeah. the current stuff gets buried under all of the old. Uh, information. It's really difficult sometimes to find up to date information for the current release. Well, you just, that's just SEO. You do canonical yeah, URLs that's and things like that. that. That's a Google problem. That's Google's. Well, well and, yeah, so and I mean, the canonical as in not, have, not the company. Right. But uh, older pages that have gotten more clicks always have, you can't always control how Google ranks yeah. this stuff. Right. Uh, yeah, so you, you can, you can control like what Google's those algorithm go to. is based on. Uh, Somebody searches for something. If they click a link and then don't come back and keep searching, Google assumes they found what they're looking for and now increases the rank of that page slightly. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. So one of the ways we, we fixed it, or we think we fixed it partially, is to switch to using Ask Ubuntu, a Stack Exchange yeah, style site. Yeah, that is better. Because there, there's, there's a few ways that fix it. One way is it's not a wiki that's got some onerous... Um, barrier to uh, to edit pages, um, you can easily tag things and say, well, this works on 904 and 910. Right, and right. oh, hey, it works on 1204 yeah. and, you know, whatever release as well. And rubbish gets 
buried and good answers get voted up, just like Reddit. You know, the good stuff bubbles yeah. to the top. There is a negative to it, though. What's that? Uh, like, for example, uh, just uh, I run a, a I work on a project for a, a download manager. And if you go to, to ask, ask Ubuntu and you search for, you say, you ask any question about a download manager, they will so they will say that this this question is a duplicate and send you to another question that oh, yeah. has about 30 answers and 10 of those are valid but not specific to what they want duplicate so, duplicate yeah. duplicate duplicate well, yeah i'm looking at it right now expand on that too i found that i would agree that it is vastly better than the wiki system no question about it it's like reddit i love that part of it my only gripe is that a lot of the stuff that gets voted up is crap because a lot of times it's like it's technically the correct answer, but honestly, sometimes the answers are so overkill that they turn new users off. And I have an inbox full of people screaming for help daily for, from Ubuntu users that had to kind of testify to that. So I think it's the it, right approach. I just want to see more vetting. Hmm. Um, you, you, need, you, you, you need both it. setups, though, because yeah. like the question and answer format works great, especially when somebody has a question. Sure. Uh, and uh, so it... it it works better than regular documentation for answering that question. Right, but if you just but want to if learn, you have more of a tutorial style, or mm. yeah, like a, a corpus style, where you're going to have the entirety of how to do something. Uh, the question and answer style doesn't work as well. So that's why it, you kind of need both, right? Something like the handbook, which is very like old-fashioned manual. These are the steps you go through to do these type of things, uh, and as well the question and answer because people want. You know, when you have a simple question, you don't want to know all the steps to do X. You right, want to know what's right. the answer to Y. Right. And, you want and, and, that, would, and that was popular on forums. You know, people would write mm -hmm. a tutorial for, you know, how to get your Broadcom wireless working on like 1104. And that would get loads of um, thanks or whatever, hearts or diamonds or whatever people give to people on forums. And then you'd find... Um, there would be a flurry of activity, lots of replies, and oh, you might want to tweak it for this and this use case. And so mm -hmm. the original poster would update their their post, and it would it would be golden for mm -hmm. a few months. Mm -hmm. And then you find loads of replies, and there'd be pages and pages and pages of replies, and it would then be orphaned, and nobody can edit it to fix it. And anyone right. anyone who comes to that tutorial will find pages and pages and pages of of you know, people arguing whether it works or not. And then on the very <laughs> last, last but one page is the final nugget of information that actually tells you how to make it working on your release. Yeah. And that's just terrible as well. I mean, they've all got their own, you know, um, disadvantages. And I don't think sure. any one of them is a, is a magic bullet and to ex fix you. Exasperating, really need all of them. exasperating the problem is a lot of these, uh, and this can be sometimes a problem on Ask Ubuntu because it's more user generated. Uh, is a lot of times there's a the answer is a copy pasta where you know uh, add this to your sources list and then do an app get and import this GPG key which uh, by the way by the time you're reading that that app repo is completely <laughs> dead right like and this bit yeah. me with handbrake I wanted to get the absolute latest build of handbrake yeah. I eventually just downloaded the deb but I wanted a PPA so that way I could have a nice currently updated handbrake. Uh, uh, but of course I ended up getting a repo that was totally dead. And so now, and it's not a big deal. I can go, you know, pull it out of my sources list, but I get errors every time I app get update. Now for a casual user who's just doing a little copy pasta and, and, you know, and adds that repo, that PPA and applies that update. And all of a sudden they're getting errors and they don't really know what the hell's going on. Uh, and it's, I don't know how to solve it completely other than, you know, we're, we're at least seems like we're on the right track. And it also, it's maybe if we could have, if we could have a, do a better job at informing people at the beginning of the gate. Like, because perhaps really we solved this problem years ago with IRC. Like, the, maybe the, you know, the ask, the, the, the Ubuntu support chat room is a better place to ask, ask these kind of things, but users just don't even know those things exist. I think, I think well, the Linux community actually is really to blame here. I mean, a user joined the IRC and was asking about their bootloader, and mm -hmm. they kind of got some help. But the IRC community had a massive tangent about whether to use SysLinux or Grub, and the newbie yeah. just left the channel with no help whatsoever. Right? Yeah, no, it erupts well, in I some think... sort of religious war over Grub yep. versus Lilo, <laughs> or, or never <laughs> ending that, list also... of history. No one cares about. I mean, it's like yeah, yeah. Or, or you end up with the same problem you have with a lug, right? A lug's trying to build membership and get people to come every week, but or every month or whenever the meeting is. But if people, if there's new people asking the same question every single week, are you going to spend you know, a half of your meeting every yeah. week covering the same, let's, this is how you install Ubuntu. Uh, it's, it's hard on to keep people coming back. It burns them out. That just gets boring. The whole right. IRC thing, though, oh. is 
people just need to get better mods in the IRCs. That's it's that simple. Because like I mean, there's well, thousands. People are donating their though. time to yeah, try to Netflix. help. You yeah, know, you, I know you that. You can only but... expect so much from them. Well, but like, some... I mean, when there's thousands of people like in the Ubuntu IRC, and they're just having an endless conversation about Grub versus Lilo, and somebody's needing help, mm -hmm. a mod, chances are a mod sees that and just doesn't do anything. Mm. No, I mean, so, technically, most of the time in the Ubuntu, when they'll tell them to go into off topic channel. And, <laughs> like, there, there's, because, like, the help channel for Ubuntu is just for help. And when they start talking about which is better, blah, blah, blah they say go to the off, the off topic. Maybe yeah. help, maybe Google Help Out solves this problem. Yeah. You know, here's so what solves we've the problem. Tried, uh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, uh, we've, we've had a couple of community guys in the UK who've tried doing help outs. And, and I know there's more people who want to do help outs. Um, but because they're rate limiting, you know, the invites to, to do help outs, that makes it very hard for us to evaluate whether it's a good tool or a bad tool. But the guy who's been doing it mostly in the UK, a guy called Matt, has, has, um, has found it quite successful and has had great conversations and he does it all for free as well. Oh, really? I was going to say, is he making money? <laughs> yeah. Hey, oh. He, 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 he's, his, his, um, philosophy is I learn all this from other people who gave me the information for free. So I'm just passing it on for free. Oh, all right. All right. Um, yeah. How bad it, do you feel um, now? Yeah. I feel like a jerk. <laughs> Wouldn't it be kind of um, good? Um, to I feel have great because I'm getting a wiki it. system where you could vote like on Ask Ubuntu and newer votes. Uh, well, you, you can know, more. actually on Ask Ubuntu. You can convert a page from a question into a wiki page. So if it does, if it is a, like a discussion, like should I get an NVIDIA or an AMD card? Um, that's not a technical. You know, how does how do I get the latest driver? That's a you know opinionated question. So you can convert pages from questions into wiki pages, which multiple people can edit. I feel like... Just um, like a wiki page. Uh, 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 I think that one of the problems with newbies is that for me, that I'm not from an English-speaking country, I often don't even know how something is called. Um, and mm. I prefer IRC and just say, you know that stuff when system um, starts up, not boots up, because I don't know that. Right, that, right, right. Um, it's easier in the IRC. And I think that's so basic that someone can can, can help me with, with that from, from the top of his head. Yeah, yeah, that's a good no, point. That's a good point. Good, that's good perspective, too, because I didn't even think about the challenges when you don't quite know what it's called or how to say it. That mm -hmm. just it's a whole layer of complexity on top of that. What about okay? What about something like a community that was really focused and a large community of you know maybe several thousand Linux users who was really focused on being that front line of support that people could come to? And it'd be great if there was a way to monetize it for some folks too. So maybe they could make a little money on it. Uh, money, maybe money talks. You know. Yeah, maybe it's a Bitcoin tip system. Maybe it's a maybe it's like a a, a flatter type system. But it'd be you know, remember uh, like LinuxQuestions.org and a lot of those kinds of sites. Wouldn't it be awesome if like if there was a full fledged like there was video and audio and forums and 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 by forums I mean something like the Ask Ubuntu type Stack Exchange type system. Uh, I think that would really if like if if that became known almost as like a brand. This is this is the brand of an organization of yep. people who help Linux users. And then if somehow that became popular enough, people knew where to go, or people had heard about it, or at least enough word of mouth spread happened that oh you switch to Linux, oh you should go try out. XYZ, go look at their site because they got a ton of great info. And I feel like that would do it. Like almost like how the Linux Foundation is focused on uh, the core agendas of Linux and financing the core development of Linux and, and representing Linux. It'd be amazing if there was another foundation that was focused on um, maybe new user switchers because I feel like uh, we're entering 2014 with with SteamOS, which is our which is our next topic, and I, I don't know about you guys, but there are there are a surprising I don't know if you've seen the post. There's a surprising amount of Windows users who are switching. Like they're like, hey, I'm going to try out switching to SteamOS today. Like they say they're going to switch to SteamOS. It's crazy, but we're going to have more people coming to Linux than ever before because Windows is continually being cocked up with X, next next version. Now they're going to supposedly. Uh, with Threshold, they're going to add the start menu back, which is going to be a total uh, cluster because they're still going to have these weird mixed desktop metaphors going on. And it's totally going to flop in the enterprise. The enterprise is going to be looking for something to move over to. Gamers are looking for something to move over to. The economy is sucking super bad. Nobody has money. They're trying to get more investments out of the existing machines they already have. So they're switching over to Linux. The amount of people moving into Linux, it's like it, there's just not the support infrastructure required to make it all work smoothly for these people. I, I'd love to see something like that set up.
Um, I think that it, it would be great if if, the, if all the distros put when you download and install that you have, if you need help, click here and then it will go to the site with with Linux help. Like the Mint or, or the maybe. Mint. They, are, they are starting to, like the Mint has done that for a while, like um, Manjaro does that. Mm -hmm. I think Integra does it too now. I go out and pop up in and say, like, if you need help, go here. If you need IRC, I mean, there's 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 help here. islands, right? There's Ask Ubuntu, there's the Arch Wiki, there's the Gen 2 Wiki, there's the Fedora forums, there's all, the OpenSUSE community. They all, man, everybody, every distro really has their own islands. But I, I feel like that's, first of all, uh, kind of like of, a linuxquestions.org uh, 2.0. Right, we need <laughs> Basically, some, let's, 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 let's consolidate the effort, is, right? Let's consolidate yeah, right. the effort. One spot, one, and I, the reason I use the word brand is because I don't like it, but that's what resonates with just average users. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is this is something I know I can trust. It's it's a it, it's a helpful thing, and and we can all go there because I, I honestly think it's like if somebody downloads um, Integros or Kodora, right? Do you really expect them to figure out like that they should be going back to this other distros forums, yeah. which are going to be more active than the sub distros forums because they're just a spin of the other distro? That's ridiculous. It's not going to happen. But it's never, funny, never the, know the original distro. You're on a spin of that distro. On um, on Helpouts, there's if you just search for the word Linux, there's eight pages or so oh, of really? people offering help. Yeah, there's there's quite a given that it's like limited rollout. And that's exactly the kind of thing, you know, you can monetize it at a per hour or per minute basis, or you can make it free, or yeah. you can do a mix of, of the both. Um and you know you you can basically achieve what what you're hoping for. Um, but as an individual, I just wish than, I wish Google wasn't as owning this. You know, I wish this. <laughs> I wish this was something that was more from the open source community itself. Because so there you go. The, you need a you need a WebRTC based right exactly yeah. exactly. You need a WebRTC based system with Bitcoin paid in or Litecoin or whatever you want as the payment system. So that way, it's directly from the from the uh, user directly to the producer and. Uh, it's not going through Google. They're not taking their cut. You don't have to have a wallet account. You don't have to have it tied to your bank account. And Google can't just arbitrarily shut you down. I have spent, I have submitted just this morning, just just before 9.30 today, I submitted 30 disputes to YouTube takedowns of Jupiter Broadcasting yeah. videos. And that's not all of them. I cut it off because I had a conference call I had to jump on. And that was at 30 before 9.30 today. I don't yep. want to give Google any of this stuff because they're just going to cock it up. They're just screwing it all up. And so I would love to see something that's community focused. This, well, might, be a, this might be a good way to like test the theory. Is there a demand for this type of service? What do you think well, of that? I don't know. Um, wasn't that the whole point, the, the original point of Red Hat, though? Was it provide enterprise level support for business? Yeah, for businesses. But yeah, Matt, what do you th Matt? What do you think about the concept of is could helpouts like uh, prove the concept and then the community take it from there? Well, so here's the problem. I actually have a, a help out set up. It's awesome. One little uh, tidbit, though, because I was stupid enough to use Google for my merchant account at one time years ago, I can't use Google wallets with that particular invited address. So I'm still in pur I'm still in purgatory trying to get that set up. And here I am trying to offer that. Um, and I think it, it testifies to what you're saying as far as using Google for the service. Don't run away. Run far away. Don't use. I, I've between you know their random SEO nuclear bomb set offs and all this other stuff. I think there's just too much power play there. There's way too much power. Um, I'm watching, you know, a lot of things they're doing scare me. I, I, I think there's way Very too much. much power. So. Yeah, Very much I so. don't think so. I just need I mean, you no. should. I was, <laughs> I was boiling over with anger because what's happening is, is, uh, and let, you know what? I got an idea. Let's just, uh, let's get ourselves in trouble. I'm just going to play a little music right now because what happens is every time I play a Ronald Jenkins song, who not only have I gotten a license from for all of his music, he's also somebody I consider a friend. Like, yeah. I have emails from him right now saying, hey, I'm really sorry about this. I want you to use my music. You've sold a ton of CDs for me. It's been an amazing relationship. Like, you are, you are helping me, and I want you to use my music. And now YouTube is tagging every single Jupiter Broadcasting video that has Ronald Jenkins' music in it. Well, guess what? That's just about every damn show on the network. Yep. So it's, it, whenever, whenever you hand it over to them, when, if they have the payment aspect, if they have the content distribution aspect, whatever, if they have, and also, by the way, that relationship is being established, that account is being created and established with Google, not with you directly. So if they shut down your account, that person would have to go find you on your own website, create a new account, set up a new payment system and all of that. And you know what? They're not going to do it. They're just going to find the next guy doing the help outs on Google. Yep, exactly. 
So anyways, so, that's my rant. Chris, if I can just jump back to your one brand idea, I don't think that works because what works on Ubuntu doesn't work on Arch. Well, no, so, you'd have to have different. You, yeah, you'd have to accommodate for that for sure. You'd have but, to have yeah, people that could totally do, different audiences too. I mean, you'd have to be like, you'd have to have channels to send people down the right channel, and then you'd have people that you know, you'd have representatives from the Arch community, representatives from the Ubuntu community, and maybe even eventually, like that person would push that person onto a thread on Ask Ubuntu. Like it doesn't necessarily negate the need for distro specific help resources, but it might right. help people get people in the right direction. Right, but it sounds like you're just advocating also stronger b- branding for the distro in question. So you might, instead of saying you're using Linux, say you're using Ubuntu. That'll make it so much easier for your average user to find help. Instead That's of true. putting, you know, how do I set this up and adding Linux so yep. they can get rid of all the Windows you know crap. What? Great you point. put Ubuntu and Great you get point. exactly distro specific help. Yeah. You know, because when, when I had my wife try out um, uh, uh, Mint, she, she was searching for Linux uh, application things. She wasn't searching for how do I install X on Mint Linux or how do I install X on Ubuntu Linux? How do I install it on Linux? And, and she didn't know that she's going to get a dramatically different answer by searching for how do I install Shotwell on Ubuntu than how do I install Shotwell on Linux? She, that, that, cool. that, that concept, never, she never even realizes she needed to make that, 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 that uh, clarification. Um, but, then uh, you but, get, with, uh, but with that, you fragment the Linux help. If you put to one page, the, the page can read which uh, additional you can use, or you can just choose it, and you just get help for that uh, additional specific. Yeah, and you, you when you're searching for what? like, when Sorry. you're searching for software or whatever, then you have to teach them to say, well, when you're looking for software, then you search for Linux, and when you need help, you search for Linux Mint or whatever. And now, now picture this yeah. in a commercial. You too can try this great Linux distro. Just learn to use Google. Learn to use this other tool. <laughs> then stand on one foot, twirl around in a circle, stand yeah, on your head. Too much. I mean, it's no one. No one cares. I mean, it's like <gasps> that's that's why we fall off. That's totally yeah. why we fall off. Yeah. So and that's that, just. I mean, that, and know. I remember this old article. I think it was ZDNet had it, and it was uh, this guy complaining about Linux. I remember he he tried to install the RPM. Like he tried to install oh, yeah. Yum on Debian. <laughs> to solve yeah, his you're gonna have a bad he, time. <laughs> yeah, it's not gonna work exactly. so well. And he was like trying to mix like all three package managers at once, and, wow. and wondering why he was because he searched for how to do this on Linux, and mm-hmm. he got the answer oh, for re, like CentOS, and then tried to do it on his Ubuntu machine. Man, man, yeah, that happens too. I mean, that's the yeah. problem. I mean, you uh, could you could do the way that um, if you wanted to do something cross uh, cross. Um, distro you could do it in the way that help outs do it and just tag people you know people say you know my expert area is servers and you know i deal with hard disk related problems and ubuntu a and reputation system a, a, like a no, reputation no. system like uh you know user matt is good at ubuntu support and he has 25 upvotes in the ubuntu support category that kind of thing yeah that'll work yeah well, well, like and then the someone exchange can filter software it. has a bunch yeah, of things right. like that right yeah uh, yeah someone developed as well is, i mean that would help uh, um, could you use uh, um, the the Firefox user agent to tag which Unduce do you have? A lot of this is also that's not what possible. It, most most people, if their Linux computer is broken, are switching from a second computer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. and and also if they, if they whether they do know it or not, for example, Linux Mint still shows up as Ubuntu. Right, right. right. But same yeah, things that work on Ubuntu York on, on Linux. <laughs> Also, a lot of questions too had to like had to do with like desktop specific questions, like questions about Unity itself or like XFCE or KDE, because they're like, I mean, KDE is going to be completely different on how to do something than XFCE would at oh, the yeah. same time. Yeah, very true, right? Yeah, because when right. you and you can just tag yourself with whatever desktops you're familiar with, and when someone searches, you know, what do you want help with? Filter it with this, then you know. I think but so. Way, this is to, this is also why I like the too. idea of like a video type based hangout because uh, the user might not know what quite the right things are, but if they can generally get into the direction of talking to another human being, that person will go, "Oh, oh, you're on KDE. Oh, oh, okay. I thought you were on GNOME. No, what you need to do is go to system settings, and then you need to go to appearance, right? Uh, so uh, I think that's why that that interactive aspect of it is is almost worth that money because. They can they can kind of fill that gap where the user doesn't quite even know what to ask for. Totally. Yeah. The more the more I hear, like what we're talking about here, the more I I kind of see it. It has to be a company that's doing this because it's almost sounds like you have to have like a like a, a 
almost like a conveyor belt system where you have someone that <laughs> yeah. just diagnoses the problem. Like, oh, you're like, using yep. KDE. We're sending you to our KDE guy. You know, it sounds you gotta like have you're sending a phone tag. Yeah. There's got to be an incentive. Otherwise, no one cares. My Here's the simplest fix I can think of for just like even existing systems is, first of all, for the love of Pete, incentivize, incentivize this somehow. Right. Swag, right. hats, T-shirts, a, sh- a handshake, meet meet someone famous. Well, what? I don't care. You know, wh- Whatever it is, incentivize it somewhere. More importantly, every time an update for that particular Bacon. distro rolls out, there should be a list of people that are alerted via email saying, hey, this has been updated. You have an opportunity to earn more swag. Oh, would you like to update this wiki? <clears throat> Or that would what solve about so or many problems. Tie, tie that into the help out system? Like, yeah. So um, maybe when um, when you know uh, Ubuntu fourteen oh four ships, wouldn't it be interesting if, by the way, Ubuntu fourteen oh four is shipped? Go to this URL to find out all the people on Google Helpouts that are helping people transition from thirteen ten to fourteen oh four or whatever. Right? Like when some big announce, you could tie it to anything. When some big release of something comes out, here's the people on Google Helpouts that are already totally up to date on this topic and ready to help you make the switch. And I think that you could that could be a really big opportunity too. I mean, I'm now I'm kind of coming back on the side of Google Helpouts again, just because I don't feel like there's a better option yet. But I'd love to see some more. The, the a- Stack Exchange system has a lot of this already kind of built in, and the like they incentivize it with just badges. But you could yeah, uh, that helps. Yeah, yeah, that augment yeah. that by you know if Canonical donates a thousand T-shirts, uh, exactly. then the first thousand people to get. Uh, a thousand rep points can get a free T-shirt. Yeah, and titles, or assigned like titles, meaningless titles. People love titles. Well, that's I don't what know why. badges are. Like I, I got yeah. the uh, yeah. the achievement uh, teacher because yeah. when I answer a question, I don't ex- just answer the question. I also explain why it is that way. Right. Yeah, that would be awesome. I like the badge idea right? for sure. Or you get like uh, you know analytical because mm-hmm. of the way I'm that, be honest, I that would work. That would work. That would totally work. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of a gamification of support a little bit. And yeah, so the stack exchange software has all of that already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mark could just uh, throw a few space bucks into that, right? I hear that's how that works. Well, you know, you become like the super gra- granular spaceman wizard guy or whatever, like the best of the best, the ninja, whatever. Then you get to meet Mark in person or something. Oh, you know, whatever it may be. You know, something cool. Uh, <laughs> like, you know, what I meant... I have, most of my points are in answering Nginx questions on server fault. Yeah. When I met Mark in person, uh, it was at an Ubuntu conference, um, and uh, he was working with... Uh, he was talking to a guy from Intel... And they had this tiny micro PC. This was this was before the iPad. This was this is um, a long time ago. And Mark was playing with this little uh, this little Intel based PC running Ubuntu that was I've never seen a computer this small. It was a full fledged like micro computer with a, with a with a bigger QWERTY keyboard. I think if I recall, Popey, you know what I'm was talking about? Was it an Intel classmate? Uh, maybe I maybe it was when the classmate the was brand sounds new. Right. That yeah. might have been when it was. That it was it was really it has cool. A round a round mouse touchpad. Yeah, unconventionally. Uh, I can't remember if it had a touchpad or not. But I I mean it's oh, anyway. it's funny now looking at the whole the whole Ubuntu Touch effort and now how captivated Mark was by this device back then. Mm-hmm. You can kind of it's you you see the history connect. Um, all right, well. So I do want to actually touch on the topic of SteamOS a little bit because we've got a great resource in the Mumble Room today, and uh, he's the uh, creator of Simple uh, Screen Recorder, and he's been working on how he's actually the guy I found out that uh, that the uh, GNOME desktop session is running in a separate X session than the actual Steam uh, big picture interfaces by his uh, commentary in our uh, Linux Action Show subreddit. So I want to talk to him a little bit about his efforts on setting up and configuring and building Simple Screen Recorder to record uh, SteamOS. But before we get to that, I want to thank DigitalOcean. Simple cloud hosting. Uh, DigitalOcean is dedicated to offering the most intuitive way to spin up a cloud server. It, I got to tell you. I set up a uh, I set up a cloud uh, a droplet as they call it called Europa because Europa is a moon of Jupiter. I'm, yeah, I know I'm funny like that. I, and I, you know what they say users can create a cloud server in 55 seconds. I don't want to brag. I created mine in 45 seconds. Pricing plans start at only five dollars per month for 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD. Yes, an SSD, and yes, it makes a difference. One CPU and a terabyte of transfer right there for five dollars. A terabyte of transfer. Right there in the plan. DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, and Amsterdam. Actually, they got two in New York, son. I got my uh, droplet in uh, New York number two, which has been fantastic because then I get something. I have I have uh, facilities here on the West Coast at, on my own fiber connection, and I have facilities on the uh, East Coast, which is 
awesome for the kind of distribution I'm doing. Uh, by the way, the uh, interface on DigitalOcean is super simple, intuitive. The control panel is powerful, and they also have a very straightforward API if you just want to write something that talks to it. DigitalOcean Digital also offers a uh, vast collection of tutorials in their community section, and users can submit an article. And if DigitalOcean decides to publish it, you'll get $50. We'll have a link to that in our show notes right, right underneath the DigitalOcean banner. But guess what? We got a great deal for you. If you want to get started at DigitalOcean, we'll get you a $10 credit by using the promo code Linux Unplugged December. Linux Unplugged December. All one word will get you a $10 credit. Now, if you get the $5 a box like I've got, that'll get you two months. And I guarantee you, a Linux box connected to a super fast internet connection in a data center, basically on any major geographical location you want with SSD backs. And by the way, runs on top of KVM. You can choose Ubuntu, Fedora, CentOS, goes on, goes on, goes on. And it's awesome for $5 a month, and we'll get you $10 credits. So you can try it for two months. You're going to find something to do with that. So go over to totally. DigitalOcean.com, and a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. I love my DigitalOcean droplet, Matt. Loves it. Good stuff. Love it. I want to uh, bring in uh, Martin here. So, uh, Martin, you've been working on Simple Screen Recorder, and you've been playing around with SteamOS a little bit. Tell me a little bit about what you found so far. Uh, okay. Uh, SteamOS is actually just well, a Debian distribution, but uh, Valve made some changes. Um, so they, they don't use the Debian repositories. Uh, Valve has their own repositories, which is actually just a really uh, stripped down version of Debian. So they, they don't have any packages that they don't need. I think if you look at the packages that are actually installed, it's like all of them. Uh, so that's a bit of a problem if you want to... Uh, yeah, load other open source applications. Well, were you able to add just the regular Debian repos to the sources.list file? Uh, yeah, you can, but uh, there are some conflicts, I think. Uh, I, I did it. Uh, um, uh -huh. it. It just, well, it, it will pull in some uh, applications that, uh, no, not applications, but things like Grub that were updated. Okay. Uh, it, it didn't break for me, but I'm not sure, uh, so I, I don't really recommend that. Okay, okay. So what, how, what kind of success did you see with running Simple Screen Recorder on uh, SteamOS? Yeah, so n right now it doesn't really work yet because the, the, the Valve has split the desktop and uh, Steam itself, so they're, they're actually two separate accounts. Uh, and when you switch between them, it's like switching to a different user account on a normal uh, Linux desktop. So if you try to uh, run an application on the desktop, like simple screen recorder, and you try to record it, and then you switch back, well, you, you won't see anything. Uh, and it you know, it also breaks things like uh, key, uh, keyboard shortcuts. Oh, uh, yeah, so right. it's, uh, yeah, a lot of things that I still have to work around. And you can't you so you can't share the same uh, home folder. So if you record something on one desktop, now have you been able to record the Steam OS session? Uh, I, well, I can record the desktop, but I've, I haven't really tried yet. Well, one one other problem is I'm uh, doing all this in a virtual machine right now. Oh, okay. And uh, I didn't get hardware acceleration to work, so it's yeah, really, really slow. Yeah. Uh, so it's a bit hard to test it now. I guess it kind of makes sense that they'd break that off into its own user account and and all of that. Um, hmm. Well, I I mean, I'm sure you'll work on it over time. I think it's something that people will want to do quite a bit. Because, you know, I mean, that's your Steam, simple simple screen recorder is an awesome utility. So Yes, it is. Keep us posted in the uh, Linux Action Show subreddit, would you? Okay. All right, very good. All right, guys. Well, uh, so uh, we have um, one bit of email I want to get to before we wrap up for the day today. And it's actually on the uh, topic of lugs as well. It wasn't exactly a, a explicit follow-up to our episode last week, but uh, I'll read it. Matt, maybe you and I will uh, kick some thoughts around, then yeah. I'll bring in the mumble room to get their final thoughts on it. But it comes in from Archie, and he wants to talk about starting a lug. Now, I know we had somebody in the mumble room last week who was interested in that. I don't know if we still do, but we'll jump in there in a second. He says, hey, Chris and Matt, been a longtime viewer of LAST. However, this is my first time submitting a question to any of the shows. During the last episode of Linux Unplugged, you touched on the topic of lugs. I'm living in Estonia. And as far as I know, there's no existing lug in our country. Moreover, I could not find any active lugs in either Lativa or Lithuania. Lithuania. Oh, geez. Oh, Lith man. Uh, Lithuania. I, I used to know how to pronounce it, but I can't. Lithuania. Uh, I'm going to go with Lithuania, uh, which is Lithuania. our closest neighbor. <laughs> oh, my. Yes, that's right. Uh, so I was thinking about starting one in my country. However, mm. I'm struggling to find a direction in which to go. I mean, I could personally give a couple of short talks, but that's mm -hmm. basically it. I have some friends who are very passionate about Linux, but I really believe organizing an install fest is kind of dull. As you mentioned in the show, lugs are all about meeting people in real life. But what could be the reason that would convince people to physically come to one place and discuss stuff? From what I understand, 
There are some people in the audience who have some experience with participating in a lug, so maybe they could give some suggestions. Keep up the great work, Archie. So he talked on it. So I thought, first of all, Archie has a good insight. So I think one of the things he was talking about here was holding talks to bring people to the meetup. And, you know, I think that's a really good idea. If there's a topic on Linux or if there's several topics on Linux that, Archie, you're comfortable with uh, and you could volunteer to hold talks to bring people in, people will come. And if they have, you will find that the people that come to watch your talk likely have uh, have topics and subjects they are qualified to have talks yes. on. And you can yes, work with them. Yes, that would be my experience. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering, like, so, you know, Matt, getting things started, uh, I like the idea of, I mean, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but using a resource like Facebook and finding people in your local area who share a common interest with you and maybe establishing like a group on Google Plus or a group on Facebook or whatever it is where you guys virtually kind of collaborate initially. And then once you kind of have a a core group, maybe move to doing something local. I would actually do that, but I will also integrate the uh, talks idea, as you pointed out. Also pointing out that in Estonia um, and a lot of other countries, um, there are social networks that are perhaps more popular there than they are here. And I forget I, – oh. so I can't think of their names off the top of my head, but Facebook-like uh, networks for sure. Um, but I think the talks idea is good. I think that also uh, offering – for people that have never even heard of Linux, if you want to get fresh, fresh blood into it, actually saying, hey, do you have an old XP machine that you are just discovered is going to become a paperweight here very quickly? Right. Let's have a look at that. Maybe. Yeah. Not necessarily an install fest, but right. let's actually look at your options. Look at the um, look at the headlines. Take yeah. advantage of that. Hey, mm-hmm. did you hear XP is support sending? Well, exactly. come to our group and we'll show you how to get more value out of that old PC. And then you wink and the little gl- uh, glitter on the tooth. <laughs> all right. Well, let's. Uh, I'll bring the bring the mumble guys back in. So, yeah, anybody yeah. in the room have experience with starting the lug or have ideas for Archie on how he can get started with creating a local lug? Maybe the first lug in his country. Um. So, sorry. Uh, I was just going to say. Uh, you were saying about incorporating things like Facebook, uh, Google Plus, etc., social networks. Um, you might you might actually run into some problems there because at least I've found that a lot of the people that are really into Linux and would love to go to Lugs are the people that don't really use them that much. Oh, different audiences. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not so sure. I think there's certainly a crossover of refuseniks who hate social media and scoff at that yeah. kind of stuff and the, the privacy issues I, that I, surround I, the it. people who know better right right uh, there's, <laughs> there's a crossover like, you know the venn diagram has a massive overlap between them <laughs> yeah. and people who go to linux user groups but we um my local linux user group uh, on the subject of talks they do exactly that. They put a mail out on the mailing list and say, because uh-huh. we, we have a mailing list and an IRC channel. We have a Google Plus page, a Twitter account, and I don't think we have a Facebook page. Um, but that's just because it hasn't been done yet. But the, um, we put a mail out and say, look, we're having a meeting at this time on this day. If anyone wants to give a talk, let me know. And then they build up on the web page. And on the day, we set some times uh, when the talks are going to be given and the rest of the time is just general chit-chat and support and that kind of stuff. Uh, and that works out really well. I've, I've listened to some really diverse topics, like three completely different things that you, you wouldn't put in a track on a, a conference together. Right, right. You know, completely wildly different things, but all interesting and all, you know, or, or not necessarily all interesting. Some, some of them are just, you know, not interesting to me, but interesting to half the rest of the, or the audience. But then the rest of the time you can sit there and, you know, fix someone's PC or something. I think a mailing yeah. list is a really key point because you could have people subscribe to the mailing list. You could say, hey, are you interested in Linux? Do you live in this area? Subscribe to our mailing list. You wait till that mailing list is built up to a substantial subscriber base. And then that's when you start to pull the gun or pull the trigger on, on the local stuff. You know, maybe you don't start with local. Maybe you start with a mailing list. Good. Uh, um, hi, um, we have, uh, I'm from Estonia, and uh, we have a web page called pingvin.org, and that uh, kind of has all the information about uh, Estonian Linux u- users and oh, okay. and all the, those oh, things. What was it again? Uh, it was in the chat Bing-Vin, room earlier. Yeah, P- oh, okay, yeah, I'll put a link to P- it in the uh, show notes. P-I-N-G-V-I-N. Dot dot work. Yep. Oh, very good. I mean, what uh, about? And we have uh, once a year. We have it in September. We have free software day that uh, all the free software activists come to t- together and have a meeting or do co- cool things and stuff. <laughs> 
Very good. Well, thank you. I'll uh, I'll link to that. So uh, maybe uh, our writer will uh, catch that in the show notes. Yeah, definitely. Good stuff. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, so uh, just a couple of extra things in the show notes I want to point people over to. Uh, Thermonex wrote in and he built uh, Steambox on Arch and he has some scripts for that. We have a link to that in the show notes. He says, I recently set up Arch Linux on my home theater PC and I set it to boot into Xbox Media Center, the standalone edition. From XBMC now, I have a shortcut to launch Steam. Of course, I could easily boot directly into SteamOS, but it's his script, so he has an entry now in his XBMC menu, Matt. How awesome is this, right? I'm going to, you know, I actually like that better than SteamOS, just right. because it's, it's less clicks, less hassle, less It's more waiting. functional, right? You can yeah. watch your videos. And so then he's in XBMC, and he clicks it, and then it starts Steam That's in cool. big picture mode. Uh, and he's got, well, uh, I'll have a link to that. And also, of course, uh, Michael Larbell over at uh, Pharonix, uh just got in some benchmarks of uh, SteamOS versus dun 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 Windows 8.1 on the NVIDIA chip. And uh, guess what? The uh, performance is pretty much... As long as you have everything set along along the same lines, it seems like it's pretty much neck and neck. There's nothing really too outrageously different there. But uh, we'll have a link to that if you guys want to read that in the show notes as well. All right. Well, look, we're going to wrap up right here, but uh, we want to uh, hear from you. So you can join us live on a Tuesday. Matt and I sit down, we open up the mumble room and we begin our conference with our internet lug. And uh, we do that over at jblive.tv on a Tuesday. And you can find out when that's at by going over to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. Send us in your feedback on any topic we covered or topics you'd like it to hear us cover. You know, I don't know. Maybe you got something we haven't thought of. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and pop that contact link. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. All right, Matt. Well, guess what? We're, uh, we're going to do a review of Fedora 20 on the big show on Sunday. Oh, yeah. So I'll see you then, okay? Cool. See you then. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for tuning in this week's episode of Linux Unplugged. We'll see you right back here next week. <laughs> <laughs>